Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Very good. We're all awake. Fantastic. Um, my name is Gus Carlson, and I'm the president of the National Sailing Hall of Fame and the uh, Sailing Museum. And I'm so excited to be the first to welcome you to our new home uh, and to the first in-person induction of Hall of Famers here on this site. Um, the induction of Hall of Famers is the crown jewel of our organization. It's why we exist. And I'm honored to welcome our class of 2021, their families, and friends. Um, I also want to recognize that today with us, in all, I think we have 16 former Hall of Famers as well, and Gary will, will talk more about them in a, in a minute. Um, but included in that group are two of our board members, Gary Jobson and Tom Whitten. Um, I also want to recognize our board of directors and our executive committee members, members of our advisory board, and of course, our donors, without whose generosity, none of this would be possible. I also want to call out Heather Rusum, our executive director, and her team. I call them the A-team. They're responsible for all of this. This wonderful old building has undergone a remarkable transformation since we bought it just over two years ago. David Elwell, Commodore Elwell, thank you for your leadership on this. Where's David? Back there. Hi, David. Thank you. Um, to Jerry Kirby and his contracting crew, an amazing job. This is beyond expectations for us. And to so many people who've helped with fundraising, our good friend Tom Stark, um, Art Santry, um, George Hinman, of course, David Elwell, Gary Jobson, they have really made the difference here uh, in our ability to get this done. But we're not done yet. In the next seven months, the space you're sitting in right now will undergo yet another transformation. Where you're sitting right now will become a maze of exhibits showcasing the world of sailing and sailors, from teamwork to athleticism to innovation. And of course, we will honor our sailors and their contributions to the sport we love. We're on track to open, and I'm going to hold Heather to this, early May of 2022. You heard it here, Heather. It's on the record. <laughs> I also want to recognize some of the Hall of Fame pioneers um, for whom this is the culmination of a 20-year labor of love. Gary Jobson, uh, Dick Franio, Dick D'Amato, um, George Hinman, Bill, I don't think you were a day, Bill Campbell, I don't think you were a day one -er, but, you know, early on. Uh, it's their vision and their passion that sparked the idea for this almost two years ago, and it was their dedication and determination to see it through that has us within one or two tacks of the finish line. So thank you all, and I know there's nothing in sailing that's certain except that things will change, but I think we can almost call the ley line from here. As excited as we are about the building, it's what's inside that counts, and today we're here to honor and recognize and celebrate the class of 2021. Congratulations to each of you. We're so proud of you and your accomplishments and your con contributions to the sport of sailing. And I have to say, we're so delighted that so many family members and friends and other admirers are here with us today. Thank you. It's great to see you all. You know, it's not easy to get into the Hall of Fame. There's a rigorous selection pathway that starts with a public nomination process and culminates with close examination of finalists by Sally Helm, our committee chair, and her team. Inductees must clear significant hurdles and demonstrate almost otherworldly excellence and dedication in three areas, sailing, technical, and contributor. Without exception, this year's class clears those hurdles with ease. It's an honor to be in the same room with you, and we look forward to hearing more about you and from you during our program. This is our 11th induction, and with this class, we will break the 100 Hall of Famer threshold. Over the last 11 years, we've tried hard to live up to our national part of our name. 
We've had induction ceremonies at UK clubs around the country, from coast to coast, from the Great Lakes to the Gulf. And even with COVID, we held an induction ceremony last year, though it was virtual. I remember the first one in 2011 at the San Diego Yacht Club. I just joined the board, and immediately I knew I was part of something very special. The, un the inductees for that inaugural event were truly legends. Melges, Alter, Allison, Vanderbilt, Kayard, Connor, Harishoff, Hood, Jobson, Mossbacher, North, Slocum, Stevens, Turner, Barr. As a club level sailor, I was in awe of the star power, both in person and represented by family members. At the time, we also had a new honorary chairman. His name, Morgan Freeman. Yes, that Morgan Freeman. As many of you know, Mr. Freeman, who is still our honorary chairman, is an avid sailor. He calls sailing a great antidote to Hollywood. He caught the bug in 67, sailing a lightning on a reservoir in Stowe, Vermont. And he loved it so much that he moved up to bigger boats and ocean sailing. And he's so supportive of the work and our mission here at the Hall of Fame that he personally signs every Hall of Famer inductee certificate. My signature's on it too, but it's not worth nearly as much. <laughs> um, I remember at the time he became our chair and he succeeded Walter Cronkite, um, Mr. Freeman said this, if you live a life of make-believe, your life isn't worth anything until you do something that challenges your reality. To me, sailing the open ocean is a real challenge because it is life or death. There is no quarter. Now it turns out Mr. Freeman wasn't just delivering lines from a script. He'd actually lived them. In 1979, he and his wife were nearing the end of an 11-day passage from Bermuda to New York in their Alberg 30 when they ran into a storm, a snowstorm in October, about 100 miles off the US coast. Mr. Freeman recalls thinking he would, be, he would die, and he had two options. The first was to sit below and work the radio, calling for help that he knew would never come. Or, he said, I could go out there and try to change things myself. He chose the second option, braved the storm, and made, made it safely home. But as he said in a number of television interviews, and you've seen them, um, the experience changed his life. He was a journeyman actor at the time, but he recommitted himself to acting, and now, of course, he's a big star. When I look back on that trip, he said, I'm grateful for it. You can't just go hiding and hoping that something is going to save you. The only way you can measure your life is by challenging it. As we honor our class of 2021 today, I encourage you to remember our honorary chairman's words. They are genuine and authentic and born of real experience. The men and women we recognize today do not live in a world of make-believe. They challenge their own reality. They do not hide and hope for someone or something to save them. They change things themselves. And when it comes to measuring their lives, they do so by testing them. And there's no question they have passed that test. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving the National Sailing Hall of Fame's Class of 2021 the first of what I know will be many ovations this morning. Now it's my distinct honor and pleasure to introduce Corey Sertel. Corey is the president of U.S. Sailing. She's the, a, a new board member and vice president of World Sailing and 
She's a member of the board of the National Sailing Hall of Fame and has been so helpful and is a good friend. Corey, please. Thank you, Gus. Um, good morning, and thank you, everyone, for being here. Two years ago, I was at this event in Seattle. We inducted Allison Jolly into the Sailing Hall of Fame, and I had the honor of introducing her. Here we are in Newport, where 33 years ago, I raced against Allison and Lynn in the Olympic trials for the first women's only event in the Olympics in 1988 in the 470. Placing second in the Olympic trials is not my favorite memory, <laughs> but being invited to join them as a training partner and member of the Olympic team and share their Olympic success inspired me on my own journey to excellence as a competitor and as a leader in the sport. And I am so happy that Lynn is receiving this honor today. U.S. Sailing is pleased to partner with the National Sailing Hall of Fame and the Sailing Museum to both honor the inductees here today as well as celebrate the sport and through the museum expose new sailors to the sport that we all love. As U.S. Sailing's president, chairman of our board of directors, I also have the privilege of serving on the board of the National Sailing Hall of Fame. These have been exciting years to be part of developing the museum and to see the work of so many passionate volunteers come to fruition. I've been fortunate to have had a tremendous group on U.S. Sailing's board who have worked tirelessly through the pandemic to strengthen the sport and I am pleased some of them can join us in this celebration today. Russ Lucas is with us here today, and Henry Brower and Tony Ray from our board will be joining us this evening. Sailing is fortunate to have so many people who volunteer in many ways for the sport. And one of the perks of volunteer leadership, of a volunteer leadership role in sailing is the amazing people that I have gotten to know and work alongside. Uh, I'd like to call out just a couple of the people I know uh, who are being inducted today, and one of those is Dick Rose. He is one of those incredible volunteers who's being honored today that I've had the pleasure to know. Dick has served as a rules advisor to our Olympic medalist and has spent countless hours on working groups and committees at U.S. Sailing and internationally. I've seen this firsthand in our roles together representing U.S. Sailing over the years at IYRU, ISAF, and now World Sailing. As Gary Jobson has documented in his wonderful tributes to our inductees, Dick has represented the United States effectively for many years and continues to serve on World Sailing Racing Rules Committee. Great to see, her, see you here today, Dick, and congratulations. It's over here. It's over here. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> U.S. Sailing's board has made significant leadership changes over the past year. Hall of Famer Paul Kayard, who could not be with us today, has come on board as Executive Director of, the US, of U.S. Olympic Sailing. Paul is leading the movement to the Olympics through Paris in 2024 and to L.A. in 2028, inspiring and developing our future gold medalists, America's Cup sailors, and leaders in the sport. U.S. Sailing CEO, Alan Osfield, who's with us today. Alan might just want to wave. There he is in the back row. Um, is, is joining us here today, and we're excited about the journey toward excellence we have embarked on and the progress that these two key leaders have already made. I'd also like to recognize another Hall of Famer in our midst, um, Betsy Allison who has been um, on U.S. Sailing staff for a number of years, and we're excited to have her talents within our organization. 
In closing, I can't miss the opportunity to make a few comments about the importance of role models for women and girls in sailing. Thank you to the selection committee for recognizing more women this year, and I'm pleased to see that three women are being honored today. Congratulations, Jane, Dawn, and Lynn. And on, finally, on behalf of the more than 40,000 members and organizations of U.S. Sailing, congratulations to all of the inductees. Thank you. Well, thank you, Corey, and thank you, Gus. When I come into this room, I have flashbacks in life. This is where the America's Cup press conferences were held between 1958 and 1983. I could joke I wasn't even born yet, but that's not quite true. And it was in this very spot, walking through that door with Ted Turner in 1977, that Ted had had a few before he got here, and it's still on YouTube. And we had a uh, forum here a few years back of past America's Cup sailors, and some wise guy in the back said, hey, Ted, do you remember that press conference in uh, September of 77? And as only Ted Turner could do, he put his hand, head down and then put it up and said, I'd just like to apologize one more time. It, <laughs> it brought the house down. It's hard to believe it was four and a half years ago, I met uh, then Mayor Harry Winthrop here in Newport outside, and Harry had this notion that we could take this building and repurpose it into our facility for the National Sailing Hall of Fame. It was uh, quite a dream at that time, and I think David Elwell had a lot to do in the background. I've never quite heard the, the full story. But here we are, four and a half years later, and seven months from now, we're going to open the doors with all the nifty displays, and I, I am really excited. And as Gus pointed out, this is our 11th induction. Hard to believe. And this year, we have a great class of 2021, and I would call it a very eclectic group when you look at all their achievements in the sport of sailing. Achievements, uh, contributions, and performance are all sitting right here in our stage. So in 2020, unfortunately, as we all know, we had the pandemic with COVID-19, and we did do our induction uh, virtually, but I would like to recognize uh, three of the living members who are here with us today in the front row. If you'd please stand up. Robbie Haynes, our Olympic gold medalist. Robbie. <laughs> Dave Perry. <laughs> hey Dave, while you are here, I was coming into the Windward Mark the other day. <laughs> okay, I, I just want to make sure I was good. I was on port and I didn't mean to hit him. Or the mark, is there a way out of it? Okay, very good. And uh, the author of at least 34, but maybe more books, John Romanier. John. So Robbie, Dave, and John, we all clapped for you virtually last year, but I thought you should receive that here. And we have a little video that we'd like to share from last year honoring all of our inductees from 2020.
morning to that list. We have several Hall of Famers here with us today. They were inducted in past classes. I'm going to call your name. Please stand up so we can uh, recognize you. Ed Baird, Steve Colgate, <laughs> Peter Harkin, Stan Honey, Bob Johnstone, Rod Johnstone, Allison Jolly, Mark Reynolds, Tom Whitten, Robbie Doyle, and Betsy Allison. Did I forget anybody? All right. And, uh, and as Gus mentioned, uh, thanks for the selection committee. I, I've only been on it a few years, and I, I must say I really respect the hard work that goes into selecting who goes on our Hall of Fame. There's a long list to work through, and uh, you, you all should be quite honored to uh, have made it to the top of the list, so well done. And uh, several are here. Bill Campbell's with us, Linda Linquist Bishop, Sally couldn't be here, a little boat show in Annapolis going on. Corky Potts, Ralph Naranjo, Mike Topa, Craig Lewick, uh, Bob Johnstone, Mark Reynolds, Margaret Potlick, Glenn Burton, and David Schmidt are our uh, members of the selection committee. So thank you for your service. Okay, we got all the business done. We have one more item to do this morning, our inductions. And uh, we've done this alphabetically but it got a little confusing because we're inducting two people at once, and the solution was easy with the word Alcourt. Alexander Bryan and Cortland Henniger had this idea of some kind of windsurfing contraption uh, that they wanted the Red Cross to use to go save people. It didn't work. And then he came up with this nifty little boat with a flat deck, thinking, well, you could make this boat yourself, and they had a good name for it, the Sailfish. Well, uh, uh, Brian's wife, Aline, said, this thing's not very comfortable. Where do I put my legs? So they put a cockpit in it, but it had to go from the sailfish to the sunfish. I took my daughter when she was two and a half years old sailing on a sunfish that I had, and she kept calling it the funfish, which, uh, you know, I think about that, might not have been a bad name either. Well, anyway, there's no, uh, no secret that 330,000 of these boats have been made are ubiquitous around the waterfronts of the world. The sunfish is special. They uh, like to say they're just a couple woodworkers doing this, and they, they struggle a little bit migrating over to fiberglass. But in fact, one went to Yale, one went to Dartmouth, and they were very astute businessmen, did very well, and a lot of people got to go sailing. And while we're here today, there's a Sunfish World Championship taking place in Miami. So I'd like to invite uh, the son, Tim Bryan, up to the stage and the daughter, Sage Chase, the daughter of uh, Cortland and the son of Alexander. Come on up. We're gonna, we're gonna give you the clock first. Come down here. Bear with us now. Right there, right here. We have the best photographer in the world, right here, Daniel Foster. Well, we didn't know what Gary was going to say, so I'm not going to repeat everything. The sunfish, sailfish sunfish story is pretty widely known because honestly, they weren't aiming at anything wonderful. They were two guys who'd been friends since kindergarten who went overseas in World War II and wrote to each other saying, we want to start a business and just have fun if this war ever ends. And both were hardworking, diligent, 
smart. I'll admit my father didn't graduate from Dartmouth, but he was smart in there somewhere. And he loved woodworking. That was his life. And I have to say, I think that Uncle Red, his dad was probably the, the engineer or the brains of the outfit, and my father <laughs> was the woodworker. But anyway, um, we are very proud of their accomplishment and delighted that the Alcourt legacy will, rem will be remembered because it is an American success story. They represent a different kind of contribution to the sailing community than many of you, since they did not spend most of their time on the water. They were inventors and craftsmen, always most comfortable making things and solving challenges. After they came back, ni neither one of them was in it for fame or fortune. Uh, when they came back from the war, the first order of business for my father was to pursue my mother, whom he had been courting since 1942, and he watched her marry her college roommate's younger brother from Alabama and proceed to have twins. He became my godfather, and then when my father was killed in the war, he resumed the courtship after about a year, and he married her in 1947. And he Got, he inherited two toddlers, twins, and had that going on at home while he's trying to make a living, doing what they had not really figured out yet. When they started, they rented a loft from a friend, and their first letterhead, well, first of all, they combined their names, Al and Court. Honestly, it should have been called Redbud because it was Uncle Red, Brian, and Bud Heinegger to absolutely everybody. Um, they, came, they came back from the war and worked really briefly at big manufacturing companies in Waterbury, which is called the Brass City. That didn't ring their bells. So they formed Alcourt, and the first <laughs> thing, they would repair anything made out of wood. The first letterhead for Alcourt read, ice boats, rowboats, and toys. They would make anything out of wood if you paid them. I even have a little bobby pin box with rounded edges that my father made for my mother. But both were avid ice boaters, and they began, to use, they began designing one to use for, work, for use on the water. I have letters saying that it was a flop. The dimensions were all wrong. It really wasn't going to work on water. Then they got the idea of putting a sail on a surfboard, which, as Gary said, was really to be a rescue boat of sorts. Uh, after a number of adjustments, it was actually quite fun. So they called that the sailfish. And a visiting friend, whom they did not know worked for Life magazine, talked her boss into putting an issue out in August of 1949 with pictures, and all of a sudden these orders started flying in. And they had made like 10 boats beforehand, mostly for friends, and all of a sudden they were totally overwhelmed. They had to find a new place to work. And then in the early 50s, they developed the sunfish, which as Gary said, was because Tim's pregnant mother could not fit her figure into the, onto this flat slab. I remember Pop coming home covered with fiberglass um, when they were experimenting in that time. The logo, the sunfish logo, my father made by tracing a nickel. In 1969, the business had grown to be way too much for them to oversee. They had set up a factory, which the city of Waterbury was quite proud of. But they were not really building the boats anymore, and that was the fun part. So they sold it to AMF and went on to enjoy a retired life. Pop began making museum-quality miniature furniture for my mother, and he also worked in metal at the Woodbury Forge. Uncle Red headed to the golf course. Though they rarely spoke of their accomplishments, both were proud to have contributed to the business reputation of Waterbury and to have provided a safe and caring workplace for locals who remained devoted and held reunions right up until the last year or so. 
What our families are most proud of is that a time when all of America was trying to get back to normal family life after the war, Alcourt made a boat that was inexpensive, especially in kit form, fairly portable, and very easy to sail. It introduced thousands to the basics of sailing and the freedom and exhilaration it can bring. Who knows, some of you may have started out on a sunfish. Tim? We have not seen each other in 60 years. He was three years old, and we, I mean, he was about three months old when we met, and, and we've had a wonderful time getting to know each other. Tough group to follow. A good day to you all. It's a, today I want to spend a little time and talk about two children who were best friends, in the pages reference who the common goal of being craftsmen and having some fun in post-World War II era. That's Court Heinegger and my, my dad, Alex, or Red. My name is Tim Bryan. I'm a proud son of Alexander Red Bryan, and today I have the privilege of accepting the National Sailing Hall of Fame Award on behalf of my father, representing my family as well, specifically my brother Alex, my sisters Cornelia and Jody. Our father, Red, was a great guy. He was very private, unassuming, yet quiet, quite an adventurer, explorer, entrepreneur, particularly as a young man. In his silence, in his quiet determination, he displayed strength, generosity, patience, courage, dedication to his family, his business, his town, and his friends in a way that reflected heartfelt and perhaps old-fashioned sense of duty. Uh, as Sage had mentioned, my father and Bud were not true mariners. They were a little bit different than the inducted members here today. But they had engineering minds, and they're really described as two nice guys sitting in a pile of wood chips. <laughs> By chance, in being in the right place at the right time, Dad and Bud created a boat designed for fun, for speed, and an affordable wallet, and that's the sailfish and then later on to the sunfish. Life magazine called the boat the world's wettest and sportiest boat, where the crew were in the water more than they were out. Personally, my favorite memory was being on the sunfish with way too many people, tipping it over, turtling it, and just diving off the platform for an hour or two. The sunfish was designed to be the boat you could throw on your rooftop of your station wagon and head for the nearest lake or harbor with your family and your friends. It's been 70 years, and this one design beauty remains the same. The same fam, fun family boat it was designed to be. The colorful sails and the unique hull colors were never experienced before. Alcourt's legacy is not about winning the big regatta or being the flashiest boat in the harbor or one of the prettiest lines. Their legacy was in creating an incredibly fun boat for the entire everyday family. Neither Dad nor Bud ever bragged, and they looked for credit, uh, or never looked for credit where they deserved it for their other accomplishments. This award would resound, astound both of these guys. When asked to my father, why were you so successful? Dad said, there's something really friendly about these boats. They achieved their goal of boat building, and doing so, they changed the world of sailing forever. Thank you, Dad. Thank you, Bud. From all the sailors here who just want to have fun on the water, mission accomplished. Did you like the name Funfish? Yeah, it seemed to fit. So here's a little trivia question. How many American sailors have won an Olympic gold medal and the America's Cup, a winning boat in the America's Cup? I can count two. One of them is Buddy Melgas, and the other is our next inductee, Carl Buchan. Carl uh, came on strong as one of the top laser sailors in the world. He was the collegiate, uh, intercollegiate sailor of the year. He's won uh, championships in Flying Dutchman and I think 505s and is uh, active with his, uh, very, his family, which I hope Carl will tell us a little bit about. 
Carl and uh, Jonathan McKee, I think, surprised the world. And, and like you, Corey, they just barely won the trials over Gary Knapp and uh, Cam Lewis, and then they went and got a gold medal. So I think Gary and Cam take a little pride that maybe they helped tune up uh, the others to get to win that gold medal. So with that, our next uh, inductee, William Carl Buckin, Jr. Carl. Thank you for the kind words, Gary. Um, I guess I get to talk about sailing and about myself, two of my favorite subjects, so that should be pretty easy. Um, you know, I've heard it mentioned from time to time, or to time to time, that uh, coming from Seattle or having a full-time non-sailing job or spending a lot of time with my family um, are, have been things that maybe I've had to overcome. Uh, quite the opposite in a lot of ways. Uh, I've always felt that those were some of my uh, greatest strengths and that I really had e every advantage um, possible growing up and, and throughout my sailing career. Um, I think first I mentioned, uh, you know, being from Seattle, uh, it's 800 miles to drive to San Francisco, which is about the closest place to go for a, for a big sailing event. Uh, but really, I came along at the time when the laser was taking off, and, and, and I always just thought that we locally right there had the best competition uh, anywhere. And that, a lot of that was thanks to the efforts of Dick Rose, who's right here. Um, so it's, it's great to get to share this with him. But you know, Dick organized and promoted our local laser fleet, and, and that I think you'll probably see in my talk a recurring laser theme. Um, but that, you know, really became a huge formative part of my life. Um, and, uh, you know, job-wise, I, I think I, uh, most of you probably know that I worked for my parents. Uh, I think that I probably had the, uh, the most supportive and, and flexible boss that you could possibly imagine uh, when it comes to taking time off to go sailing. Um, I guess the only thing maybe would be that a lot of times if we were, it was the case that we would both be gone at the same time to be going sailing. So that probably was a little bit more of a stress on the company, but we always had our priorities straight. So, um, and then with regard to my family, um, again, that's just to me been a huge plus and a strength and it's, and it's just been awesome for me to get to share all of my sailing with my family really, uh, you know, chronologically, I suppose it starts with my parents and even my grandparents. Uh, my grandmother and grandfather crewed for my dad in the Mallory Cup in 1954. And, um, and then when our kids were growing up, my wife Carol and I, we could drop them at my grandmother's house uh, when we were going sailing. She lived just right out there on the way to where we would go sailing in the 505. and. Um, and then uh, I actually I met my wife Carol uh, sailing lasers, um, and uh, she she was she came over and helped me put my boat on top of my car. Uh, but I just also the support uh, that I received from Carol uh, and our daughter Lindsay, both of whom are here, uh, has really been a special part um, of my life and of my sailing. Uh, they are both accomplished sailors in their own right, and uh, I've been really lucky to get to sail with them and against them, uh, both crewing and skippering, all aspects of it, big boats, little boats, uh, watching them sail. Uh, that's been just some of, the, um, some, of my, some of my favorite memories. I've also, our son, who I know wishes he could be here, but uh, wasn't able to. Uh, I've also been uh, 
able to do a lot of sailing with him. He's been my uh, loyal star crew for the last 15 years. Once he got done with a brief hiatus as a as a rower, um, and uh, he came back to sailing. So, <laughs> um, and even now, one of the one of the pluses about COVID is um, since when our kids sail with us, um, there's no babysitters. We also get to have our grandkids sail with us. So. Um, I, I guess just being able to share that with them as well is, is great. Um, you know, I have also been fort fortunate to enjoy some superb mentors, uh, starting out even with our local uh, single-handed fleets. Um, but I wanted to especially uh, mention Buddy Melgus and Peter Barrett. Um, they both had a way of making me feel special whenever I'd talk to them. and. Uh, Although I will say that I think I know that both of them had a way of making a lot of people feel special, so that's a real skill for them. And uh, you know, Peter especially, uh, if I was talking to him, he just could make you feel like you were the only person in the world. Um, and so for me, one of the things I've enjoyed about sailing is uh, being involved in the lives of some of our local young local sailors as well. Um, but you have to be careful. One of them, Dalton Bergen, wound up marrying our daughter, and um, uh, which is actually, you know, super. Uh, and, and so I've got a son-in-law that I uh, get, who's a very good sailor that I get to go sailing with as well. And you know, I'm also really appreciative of the support that I received at the national level. Uh, I would single out Sam Merrick there for all of his work as part of our Olympic campaign. And I know that a lot of others who are involved that time around would echo that. Uh, and even just being recognized uh, with honors like this. It's just, it's really touching. Um, I've also been fortunate to sail with some really good sailors uh, over the years. And I would single out uh, Jonathan McKee, who Gary mentioned, and Hugo Schreiner, who sailed with me in the Star for a number of years. And uh, you know, I think that uh, Hugo, when I sailed with him, I felt like I was being pulled around the course on the boat. Uh, just, uh, and, I, and uh, yeah. Uh, so you know, anything I've ever done uh, sailing, racing-wise, I've always done it because I enjoyed it and it was fun. Anything, uh, any project, has never been contingent upon the winning. I've always wanted to win, and, and uh, but uh, I think that I enjoy the preparation. For me, that includes working on the get working on the boat and getting that ready. Just the sailing for the pure joy of it, the competition, and seeing old friends and meeting new ones. Um, yeah, I think that the first regatta I did when I was 16 was the U.S. Youth Championships. And, uh, and I'd like to, you know, some of the people who put th that together are, are here as well. Uh, that was back in Chicago. Uh, other than another team from Seattle, when I went back there, the only person I knew was Mark Reynolds, who's here as well. And Mark was the one who called me up to let me know that I had been chosen for the Sailing Hall of Fame. Uh, in the first race, I was pretty starstruck, and uh, so I was not doing well at all <laughs> around, the, around the first triangle. The second beat, I just kind of forgot about all the other boats and started sailing and rounded the weather mark, and nobody, nobody was in front of me. And, um, and the guy right behind me, <laughs> the guy right behind me says, hi, I'm Augie Diaz. <laughs> And he's here too. Um, and uh, I immediately went back to my starstruck mode because I knew who Augie Diaz was. <laughs> and uh, he just sailed right by me. <laughs> and then um, uh, Dave Perry was also there uh, and others. And, and so the, the people I met at that regatta have been you know, some of my best friends lifelong. And, and I still see them again and again. And uh, so I'm, I'm grateful for all of my sailing experience that I've had, getting to share them with my family. Uh, I would be
be happy to do it all again, and I hope to be able to continue doing it. Um, I want to thank uh, the Sailing Hall of Fame. I'm really honored to be included in such a select group. All right. Well, Carl, I'm glad you recognize the youth movement, you know, Mark Reynolds, Dave Perry, uh, Augie Diaz, and others that are here with us today. So next up is Augie Diaz. I first met Augie at the Collegiate Nationals, uh, Eagle Mountain Lake in Fort Worth, Texas. He was fast. His team won, by the way. He later became a college sailor of the year. He's a champion in stars, snipes, various keelboats, uh, lasers, 505s. And you read about him a lot. I mean, he's an amateur sailor, and yet you read about him a lot. And every time I read about him, he's winning something. And if he didn't win, he's second or third. What a lifelong career. So next up, Augie Diaz. Daniel's getting better. He did it in two pictures. <laughs> oh, Carl. Carl was here. <laughs> so, of course, I'm so honored to be here. This is a really something that you cannot imagine when you're, uh, you know, with your sailing career. But when it happens, it's like, you know, unreal. But, of course, to get to this point, you have to thank a lot of people. First, I have to thank God. He's blessed me in so many ways, mostly with my family, also in sailing, because I've had very, very good luck all my life. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I think today my parents cannot be here, uh, but my brother, my sister, two of my sons are here. Well, I only have two sons, but my two sons... <laughs> My two sons, and I'm very appreciative that they came, Adrian and Lucas. But my mother and my father combine a set of competencies that have always been a huge advantage for me. I think, you know, every, every step of the way, I've always had the support from my mother and my father. And my father led by example. It, there wasn't a lot of uh, discussion. There was always just the example. And to me, it was a lifelong lesson when I watched him leave Cuba with zero and provide here for, for his family. Thank you, Dad. And the opportunities we had, awesome, awesome for all of us. My mother is the glue that holds our family together. She, is, uh, she has wisdom, which is a perfect melding of love and intelligence. And this is such something that to this day holds our family together. At 91, she runs around chasing my nephew's two twins that are two years old with our little brother that's one year old. I call those guys the triplets, and they are counter-terrorists in training. <laughs> my brother has always supported me. The my brother, the proud grandfather of the triplets, has always supported me all along the way. When I was a little kid, I was late talking, and my brother would interpret for me. So I would say, I would mumble jumble something, and my brother says, he needs water. You know, <laughs> uh, I, I would say something else, nobody could understand, he needs to eat. So, and then in our, in our, uh, we were partners in our business, and my, my brother made it so I could take time off for sailing which when you're involved in a big business, it, well, not big, it's a little business, but when you're involved in your own business, it's very time consuming, and he made it so I could. And I'll never forget one time, Carl was uh, driving uh, the King of Spain's boat, and Carl couldn't make one of the regattas. So uh, Ross McDonald, who ran the boat, called me, and I said, hey, no, Ross, I'd love to do it. Of course, what a great opportunity, but I don't have time. So then I, I had the sense to go and consult my brother on it, with it. And he, said, and he said to me, you're crazy. You have to go sailing with the king. 
Well, actually, there were a few expletives involved, but I couldn't repeat them here. <laughs> so basically, I think I have so much to thank for. Uh, not, you know, my brother, my sister, who's also here. I think I forgot to mention you, but she's also here. She has supported me all my life. And one, now, more than ever, I need her because my 10-year-old grandson lives with me. And my sister is like, the, we call her the general because she controls everything in the family. So one of the things she did for me was help me with my grandson, found me at the right school. Awesome. Thank you, Annie. But really, my sailing career comes down to the people I have sailed with and the mentors that have been along the way. I go over my mentors. I, I don't want to take too much time, but I'll go over my mentors first. Of course, I have to start with my, with my father. My father was a 1959 uh, silver medalist in the Pan Am Games and was second in the Snipe World to, in 1959 to Paul Elfstrom. So it was a pretty tough regatta for him, but he, he, did a, he did a nice job there. But most important thing that I, I've learned many things from my father, but the most important thing that I learned from my father is how to be a sportsman. My father sailed with a great sense of fairness, and it was that something that I've been able to learn from him and try to execute on. Uh, there were others. I had a friend of mine that was a couple of years older, but Scott Weston. And Scott is, I feel, responsible for teaching me how to be an athlete and how to, you know, compete at a hard level without going crazy. And that's something that we all need to learn. Frank Levinson. Uh, I think Frank was very important for me because at a young age, he took me under his wing, and he actually gave me a Flying Dutchman to sail, which at that time was crazy. Um, in any case, I think Frank really uh, helped me. Uh, but then I have to go over my crews, because I've mostly sailed double-handed crews, where the crew is super important. I have to start with my brother, who was expertly trained by my father, because he crewed for my father. All I had to do was step in the boat and point it in hopefully the right direction, and my brother took every took care of everything else, including the scores. If you might recall at that time when we did this, it was Olympic scoring. And I remember my brother in a Snipe Junior Nationals sitting there after four races with the Olympic scoring, and he's thinking about it, and he goes, hey, if we get first or second in this race, we'll be second overall. Of course, I didn't believe him, and I said, you're crazy. There's no way that's happening. We got second in the race. We get in, second overall. Incredible power of the mind. I had a, one of my first crews who I won a silver medal with in 1971 in the Pan Am Games was Mark Colberry. The interesting, and we did, we had so much fun sailing together, but the interesting thing about Mark is that he didn't like sailing as much as I, I did. So, but he had a, an identical twin brother who he would send to come and sail with me when he didn't feel like going sailing. You know, it would... It would take me half a day to figure out that it was not Mark and it was David. <laughs> so then I started sailing with Marshall Duane. I sailed with him in the Flying Dutchman leading up to the 76 Olympic. Marshall's a dear friend. He did such a good job of helping me, and we, we had a lot of success together. Later on, I went on to sail with him in uh, the Star, and we had even more fun then. And then comes Mark Reynolds. Mark Reynolds is a superlative sailor and athlete. I remember we sailed the FD together, and of course, Mark drove the boat from the wire. But the, and I learned many things from Mark, but there's two things that were outstanding. Number one is how to be cool, calm, and collected under pressure. Incredible. I have a quick story. Joe Duplin was um, coaching us at Keel Week, and Joe comes over, last race was pressure packed. It was us and the French and this, that, and the other, and it was who beat who, it was mano a mano. And basically, you know, Joe comes over, he puts his hands on the side deck and he goes, boys, it's time to open up the bailers and let the blood out, you know. <laughs> so Joe was a hockey coach and I was eating it up. I had, you know, rally, and all of a sudden I look over and Mark has this blank stare on his face. And he's saying, what are you guys talking about? You know, but it was that sense of cool and calm that allowed us to prevail, and it was like magic. I learned this from Mark. 
The other thing was the importance of boat preparation. Mark was, con you know, the consummate preparer, and the boats were always perfect. He did that for Dennis, and he did it on for, my, for us, and then on to get gold medals all over the place and win uh, great championships. I, I won two Snipe World Championships that really had more to do with the crew than uh, myself. Johnny Rogers crewed for me in the first one, and Pam Pennell, who was a, an af absolute uh, great girl sailor, uh, did the, the 2005 uh, Snipe Worlds with me. Um, and, of course, I have to uh, talk about Kathleen Tock, who sailed with me in the Snipe for 10 years. And uh, Kathleen is a, a, a great athlete, and she has the um, great advantage that she was also a figure skater growing up. And the balance and the way that she's able to trim the boat is very critical in all the chine boats because you got to sail them flat at times. You got to engage the 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 uh, uh, chine when you need it, and and that balance uh, allowed us to not just win many regattas, but now she doesn't sail anymore with me because she's sailing with probably arguably the best. They make the best team in the snipes in the world. She's sailing with Ernesto Rodriguez, but. Uh, we still get to uh, sail against them and try to beat them from time to time. Uh, and last but not least is Bruno Prada. He's a friend of mine from Brazil. I had the privilege, I've had the privilege of sailing. I don't know what he sails with me. Well, I do know. I know because he, he used to sail with Robert Scheid, and Robert and I were the same weight. So when, when Bruno comes to sail with me, he doesn't have to lose weight. Anybody else? <laughs> Anybody else, he would have to lose weight. And then there was another really good advantage for uh, Bruno, particularly during the Olympic years. Bruno would come sailing with me because Robert was always so busy. And Bruno comes sailing, and it was a very safe thing. If we won, it was because of him. If we lost, it was because of me. You know? <laughs> and very soon I became aware with Bruno that it was about beating, during the Olympic years, that it was about beating the other Olympic guys from the other countries with an old guy. And, and that's, what, that's what he took such uh, uh, pride in. So finally, I want to thank the National uh, Sailing Hall of Fame. This is such an honor. I'm truly, truly honored. And I want to also thank Mark Reynolds and Bob Johnstone, because I think they had a lot to, be, a lot to do with me being here. Thank you very much. We're going to go back in time a little bit here with Gilbert Gray. Gilbert Gray uh, won an Olympic gold medal in 1932, the first time the United States sent a sailing team to the Olympic Games. The Games were in Los Angeles that year, and it was during the Great Depression. They had a little struggle. How, how did we get our boat, a star, to L.A.? There weren't too many highways in those days. So they put the thing on a train, good way to travel, and they got some help from... Uh, a fundraiser at the Southern Yacht Club, which we all know is a spirited place, strong on the water, but strong after being on the water. <laughs> and they had a party, but I think they used up all the funds they raised for the liquor that night. <laughs> but lucky the head of the shipping company found a way to get the boat on a train and they got there. Gilbert Gray was the five-time uh, Sailor of the Year for the Southern Yacht Club. And after his sailing career, he did an awful lot of work on behalf of the sport as a race official, and he was a chief measurer. We have two people to make some comments, David Vosbeen, who's uh, Gilbert Gray's nephew, and uh, John Charbonnet. Thank you. John? So we gotta get a picture first. Okay, come on David. over, we'll get a picture. Thank you, Gary. It's an overwhelming privilege for me to be here today representing my uncle and godfather, Gilbert Gray, in this prestigious award. 
especially so when looking at the other inductees today. Wow, what an outstanding collection of accomplished individuals. I'd like to take a few minutes to share with you a little bit about Gilbert, the person he was, with whom I was blessed to have a lifelong relationship with him. Recalling what a humble man he was of modest upbringing that, in fact, was very reserved, sensitive, and sharing. He loved science and read every issue of the Scientific American Journal from cover to cover. Having excelled in his favorite subject of physics and applying his self-taught knowledge for his love of the sport, Gilbert became an expert. He loved sailing, as he said, it was a boat with wings. Gilbert was determined, well, in 1927, uh, Gilbert was virtually adopted by Prentice Edrington, and they sailed together in Cuba in the Bacardi Cup in 1927. Of course, they won. Uh, Prentice was a skipper and Gilbert the crew. They went on over the next three years and were first or second in competitions around the world. So Gilbert was pumped up with this, and he decided that he wanted to sail a starboat in the inaugural star class, and he was going to make it happen. Fortunately, a generous member of SYC agreed to give Gilbert his starboat. Then began the typical Gilbert preparation to have her glistening with the hull and finely painted and finely tuned to be of Olympic character. Thanks to Commodore Teche, as Gary alluded to, the required funds to ship the boat for Gilbert and his crew, Andrew Lebano, to Los Angeles were raised, solving another problem of no cash. After arriving in LA, they had to first win the uh, Olympic trials to qualify to represent the US. After winning the first race, his boat, called Jupiter II, was vandalized by some malicious-minded characters. They delayed the next race for one day to allow for immediate urgent repairs, and then they went on to win the series and thus enter the Olympics. The uh, Olympics had serious national teams, including Colin Ratsey, the UK sailmaker, who had two boats at the ready and 18 suits of sails, and a staff. Jupiter had one set of sails. <laughs> at the end of the sixth race, officials notified Gilbert and Lebano that they had already won the gold medal and need not sail in the last race. Of course they did, and won first there too. So uh, in the Olympics, he was uh, first in five races, second in one, and third in the other. So it was quite, quite a thing that they did for the US as the first time that we were competing in such an event. Unfortunately, Andrew Lobano died unexpectedly of an infection during a dental procedure shortly after his return to New Orleans. So he had a very young age, and he made this tr journey to the Olympics, and then shortly after that passed on. Besides Gilbert's love for sailing was his penchant for sharing knowledge and experience with the many young sailors who revered him. Mentoring these young sailors to be fine skippers, good sportsmen, and honest competitors. Several went on to be well-known in Olympiads representing a Southern Yacht Club called SYC. I must mention that Gilbert also was an unsung hero in World War II. He worked at Higgins Shipyard directly with Andrew Higgins, the owner and CEO. Gilbert, after Higgins won the contract for vessels for World War II, uh, 
making uh, PT boats and landing craft. Gilbert was responsible for quality control of the 12,000 landing crafts needed for the U.S. and allies to storm beaches in the war. Failure of any type was not an option, and Gilbert with his exactness, you know, was just what Andrew Higgins needed. Dwight Eisenhower said, Andrew Higgins is the man who won the war for, the war for us. If he had not designed and built those landing craft, we would never have landed on an open beach. The whole war would have been different. Uh, so Gilbert was quite a contributor there. Thereafter, Gilbert dominated in several classes of boats that he entered in competition. He sailed the uh, club owned boats of fish boats and, and dominated that class of, uh, of racing. Um, and he was sailing in the Sir Tom Thomas Lipton regattas where there were 29 series. He was first in 12, second or third, eight times. So once again, he wouldn't go in without total preparation and commitment. And he's not to be upstaged or uh, anything deter him from getting what he wants. He was a SYC race committee chairman and then the fleet measure for IOR and CCA class boats until shortly before dying in 1989, 81. Gilbert's collections of trophies were posthumously gifted to me. After Hurricane Katrina destroyed the SYC clubhouse and all of its treasured trophies, I was honored and pleased to donate his collection to the Olympic Association for permanent display in Southern Yacht Club. It is well known that Gilbert put Southern on the map as a formidable yacht racing club. What a magnificent foundation you have here, honoring many, many people who have made significant contributions to the world of sailing and to sailors over many decades. Praise to the current and prior inductees in the National Sailing Hall of Fame. And congrats to the fine staff and the people who put this together, the people who run this fine organization, allowing sailors to get recognition that otherwise might go unnoticed. Congrats to the fine staff and Gary for putting all this together. Thank you for letting me honor and share my admiration of Gilbert joining this elite group of lifetime achievers. Thank you. As you all have just heard, Gilbert's not with us any longer, and we miss him a lot. His family has very few relatives that are still with us, and that's really why I was asked to come. I sailed with Gilbert through my college days, and I can't tell you how many races and series that we participated in and finished very high, if not won them. But Gilbert could take a boat of a given class and race in that class, and by gosh, he'd get more velocity out of his boat than the other boats, which sail past people. Slowly, but enough where we would beat him. He just had the ability. Now, we, came, we come from New Orleans, Southern Yacht Club, and the class boat owned by the Yacht Club and many of the yacht clubs in the Southern racing circuit, which goes from Florida into Texas, are fish boats. And a fish boat is a gaff-rigged boat that's approximately 20 feet long. So every time you sail it, you have to tie on a main, you've got to tie on a gaff, and it takes a good knowledge of how tight you tie it for 
the weather that you anticipate. Guys used to come out on the dock and watch us with Gilbert's instructions tie the sails on to try to figure out what the heck he knew that allowed him to finish as well as he did all the time. Well, it worked, and by golly, we won, we won a lot of races. Um, his medal will hang in the Southern Yacht Club if I have anything to do with it. <laughs> and it's, it's certainly not mine, <laughs> but I uh, appreciate very much what this organization has done for Gilbert. And it's just a damn shame he's not with us. So thank you. Thank you. I'm sure you'll find a good place for the medal in the Southern Yacht Club. So you're in the Olympic Games, kind of a historic race. First time we've had a women's only division in the 470 class. It's come down to the last race. You've got the gold medal in contention. You're not favored to win a gold medal, but there it is, and you've got a problem. The problem is the jib is falling down, and uh, this puts you in about last place. It's also blowing 30 knots. What do you do? Well, you could tip the boat over and swim out and try and tie it up on the mast. You could uh, lower the jib down and try and tie it up to the halyard, or you could just keep sailing and, and probably lose your gold medal. But Lynn Jewell Shore and Allison Jolly uh, figured out how to do it. Allison held the mast with her feet, and uh, Lynn Got, found a piece of string in her pocket. I don't know why that was sitting there, but it was, and tied up the jib to the halyard. And uh, they knew they were behind, and I think they had to finish 11th in that race to get the gold medal. And like I said, it's blowing really hard. So they get around the winter mark, and they note that nobody's setting their spinnaker. So what an opportunity. Up the spinnaker goes, risking capsizing. Heck with that, a gold medal's on the line, and they got across the finish line, and it's one of the great moments in uh, our sports history. So our next inductee is gonna tell us a little bit more about that. And Lynn, you gotta introduce your mother here, who's one of my heroes, who's sitting with us tonight. Lynn Julshore. Lynn. Problem too. I know, I know. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. <laughs> I also want to recognize that um, Allison Jolly's here, and without her, we wouldn't have been there. So, <laughs> Allison. <laughs> I am very humbled and honored to be an inductee member of the class of 2021 National Sailing Hall of Fame and to be part of such a prestigious group, both past and today. Congratulations to all of you. And thank you, Corey, for those kind words. I really appreciate it. I learned to love sailing as a child. It began in a small Massachusetts town where I would spend the summer months visiting my grandparents and sailing at the Yacht Club, at Plymouth Yacht Club. In the off season, sailing was also a constant reminder. The walls of our home were covered with treasures procured from faraway places. Since both of my parents were chosen to crew for the Irving and Exe Johnson on the Brigantine Yankee Six Voyage, they are also inducted in the Hall of Fame and their family is here with us today. As a teen growing up in Southern California, I had many opportunities to play in a variety of high-level sports. Often I would mix in with my twin brother, seems to be a lot of twin stories today, <laughs> um, and his friends playing street football, riding motorcycles, hanging around with the boys until my sister Beth would remind me to act like a lady. 
Of course, I am part of, oops, wait a second. Of course, I am part of the Title IX generation. So I never occurred to me that there would be separate events for every sex. I mean, each sex, excuse me. <laughs> Some opportunities. <laughs> Oh, well, okay. Some opportunities for women were limited, but I wanted to compete against the top athletes in the field, and more often than none, those athletes were men. It was not easy, but were hours spent in the gym working up physical strength, and I invested a lot of time building up my mental toughness. Resilience, determination, and fearlessness all played a part in becoming a strong top athlete. There was no other way. Jane Pagel, Jan O'Malley, Timmy Lahr, to name a few, were a part of the first generation of sailors to go up against top-ranked male sailors. It was not an easy thing to do, but their first step in the ring laid the foundation for me and a new generation of female sailors, several of whom have already been inducted into the Hall of Fame. I hope that by following their example, I have continued to pave the way for the next generation of female sailors. It is also important to give back to the sport you love. Along with several other women, I helped to develop the junior single and later the double-handed Claggett regattas for our youth female sailors. It has been a platform for women to sail in an environment that breeds championship, competition, confidence, and success. I'm also proud of my work while serving on IYRU Women's Committee, particularly introducing an introduction of the Europe dinghy as an Olympic class sport in 1992. I must thank Mike Shuttle of the US Olympic Committee for allowing me and Luther Carpenter the opportunity to take full free reign to develop a training model that has encouraged young women sailors to become Olympians and compete for a chance for a medal. The U.S. won bronze in 92 and 96 with this model. Excuse me. My own career really started at Plymouth, uh, Plymouth Yacht Club Junior Sailing Program, college sailing, and in the laser class, where I triumphed at major national and international events against men, and also became the first woman ever to qualify for the Collegiate Men's Single-Handed Championship. Until one day, I received a letter from Allison Jolly. She wanted to know if I would consider crewing with her in a quest to qualify for the 1988 Olympic Games in Seoul, Korea. I had zero crew experience, and of course, I had been conditioned to do things my way, <laughs> but, it <laughs> but it worked. <laughs> like yin and yang, we became bonded on the water and have been in one another's lives ever since. She is more than a sailing partner. She's like a sister, really and truly very much my best friend. Which brings me to addressing the importance of crew. I have been in both positions, and it's important to recognize all members of a team, both crew and skipper, especially when the team has been a unit for a long period of time. With the crew, there is no skipper and vice versa. My experience training as a crew for the Olympics has allowed me to fully appreciate and the extra tenacity, work ethic, and strength required for the role. In fact, the intensity training helped me make a better sailor of myself, which in turn allowed me to compete in six world championships and six different class sailboats, finishing in top 10 in the J24 Etchell Europe Dinghy 470 Laser and the Snipe. Another big piece of my Olympic story was our coach and the father of my two children, Jennifer and Jonathan. Without Bill Shore's vision, planning, steady hand, we would not have succeeded in taking the gold. Thank you, Bill. After the Olympics, it was back to work. I was very fortunate to become the executive director of Sail Newport, Rhode Island's public sailing center for almost 10 years. In that time, we were able to provide the first outreach programs to inner city children, Newport's public um, school system, special needs community, Salve College sailing, and many other sailing opportunities for children and adults that continue on today. The highlight was finally raising enough money to move the main office from downtown to the new sailing center 
building located at Fort Adams. Today, Sail Newport continues to thrive under the helm of Brad Reed, who has taken it to the next level. As for me, I continue to sail in the full rig, not the radial rig, <laughs> class against the men who were my peers in the early years. I enjoy the camaraderie, respect we have for one another, and I also sail remote control sailboats. It's great when you can pop open a can of beer, chat, and not get wet. How perfect is that? <laughs> in closing, there are so many people who have contributed to my life, both in, sailing, in the sailing world and out. Certainly too many to mention here and now. You all know who you are. A special thank you to my coaches, peers, and to my family and friends, and to my mother, an accomplished lifelong sailor herself who inspired me whether I am on the water or off, do not think I don't remember every little push, hug, and ride to Plymouth Yacht Club. Thank you for being beside me every step of the way. I love you, Mom. Thank you. Six world championships, six different classes, all top 10 finishes. Strong. <laughs> Strong. So our next inductee was unable to travel uh, to Newport. She lives out in Wisconsin, Jane Pegel. I love the names of some of her boats. Frozen Asset, any of us that own a boat can uh, relate to that. Calamity Jane, she playfully called one of her boats. and. Uh, the Lake Geneva Yacht Club did have a little ceremony for her this summer, which uh, included uh, Buddy Milgas and Peter Harkin, who were there for that. Jane was a three-time, at the time it was called Martini and Rossi, uh, Yachts Woman of the Year. We now know that as the Rolex Yachts Woman of the Year. Uh, she won the Adams Cup a couple times. She's always been uh, one of the top contenders in the SCOW class and uh, spent a career helping thousands of young juniors uh, learn how to sail out of Lake Geneva. And since she can't be here, nor could her daughter Susan, however, we have a superstar and a new inductee to make comments. Lynn? Yay! There you go. Uh, Jane was one of my mentors, and Susie is a very close friend of mine, and she's taught me a lot, so it was a great honor when they called me up and asked me to speak on Jane's behalf. Unfortunately, Jane's health is in a work in progress and um, Susie's uh, staying with her. So our thoughts and prayers are to her. Uh, Jane's speech. I am, I am pleased to be inducted into the Hall, Sailing Hall of Fame and disappointed at not being able to be in Newport this weekend. It's a true honor to join the ranks of national top sailors. Growing up on Lackey Drive in Williams Bay, Wisconsin, sailing was the neighborhood thing. As a first generation sailor, I learned how to sail by the trial and error method. Those in the know around Geneva Lake told my father, Dr. Clifford Wiswell, that sort of equipment I should have, whether it be sailing equipment or ice boating equipment. I learned many valuable lessons competing against great sailors and watching great sailors in action. Having a husband who was a master boat builder and sailmaker certainly helped my race results. I consider Bill Buchan, which is Carl Buchan's dad, the ultimate role model for sailors seeking to become champions. He worked hard to perfection perfect his equipment as well as his sailing technique. He always sought to be ahead of the curve and his results in the star class reflected his dedication to the sport. Ice boating was always my number one for me for more than 60 years. I raced in the Skeeter and DN class and served as an officer and committee member in many ice boat organizations. For more than 40 years, I served on the National Ice Boat Authority, writing and analyzing the rules that govern ice boat racing. I am proud to say I mixed the epoxy when the stern steering ice boat, the Deuce, was rebuilt roughly 
a decade ago. The Deuce is the world's largest ice boat. I have watched my generations of sailors coming up through the ranks through my involvement with the Lake Geneva Yacht Club and Geneva Lake Sailing School. The tradition of champions coming from Lake Geneva is being carried by laser radial sailor Chapman Peterson and others. Thank you again for this honor. By the way, I'm not related to Johnson Boat Works family in White Bear Lake, Minnesota. Most of my relatives hail from Walworth County, Wisconsin, and Grand Rapids, Michigan. P.S. I have to say this. Many thanks to Lynn Jewell for representing Jane this ceremony. Jane and Susie enjoyed racing against Lynn in the laser class over the years. Thank you very much. About three weeks ago, I got a phone call from Peter Kellogg. Peter, who many of you know, is a passionate sailor and one of our uh, important contributors to uh, making this a reality here. And he says, hey, Jobson, you always seem to be able to get things done. My antenna's up in the air, yeah. You know, this uh, Naval War College, why don't you get the name changed to the War Navy Peace College? So there's my uh, thought from Peter Kellogg. I think he was putting me on, but anyway, I can now tell him I passed on the idea. Our next uh, uh, inductee is a historic candidate and an important one, uh, Rear Admiral Stephen Bleeker Luce. Admiral Luce uh, is one of the heroes of the U.S. Navy. He was uh, quite an interesting strategic thinker. He was the first to uh, write the Navy's textbook on navigation, and most importantly, he's the guy that founded the U.S. Naval War College, which is right up the uh, Narragansett Bay here. He was considered one of the foremost experts in uh, seamanship, and he came up with the concept that you want to train uh, enlisted personnel and officers, you want to do it underway. So with that, I'd like to invite Ann Jocelyn, who's the great-grandniece of Admiral Stephen Bleeker Luce. Welcome. What a pleasure. When I first heard about this and that my great uncle was going to be an inductee, I made the comment, are you sure that this is the most appropriate venue for him? He's 194 years old. <laughs> um, when I looked at the other inductees, they all seemed to be a little bit more vibrant and alive. Uh, then I realized um, how lucky I was because Admiral Luce has played a very large part in my life, even though he died before I was ever born. But it was he who instilled so much of what I believe my father as a naval officer became. Um, and as a child, we always had a portrait uh, of a young Stephen B. Luce over the front hall um, table as you came into the entrance of the house. Our house here in Newport happened to be Admiral Luce's grandson's house, as bequeathed to my father, over on One Cliff Avenue. His name was also Stephen Bleeker Luce, and he was the last of the Luce relatives. So if you jump over to my side of the family, which I'm very, very fortunate to be here because as John Hattendorf calls me, I'm collateral. <laughs> um, but it is someone who I have always felt close to because of growing up in a Navy family and seeing how much my father admired him. I would say this in my own words, no one loved the sea as much or believed in the sailor as much, or was a man of higher principle than Admiral Stephen B. Luce. Um, he lived to be 90 years old, 
And what I'm going to do quickly, I hope, is to do a, more of a recap of who this man really was. I found um, in the Naval Institute, a hundred years after he died, uh, asking the question, who is Admiral Luce? And this is what it said. He's lean and wiry man of medium health, um, height, thin features between iron gray side whiskers, a prominent hawk-like nose, a determined chin, and piercing gray eyes. Admiral Luce was of good humor, witty, shrewd, and inspiring, a true intellectual and a man before his times. He was a man of the sea. He was also, when it came to the Navy, persistent, unselfish, and absolutely determined to make the American naval officer and the ships that they sailed the best in the world. And there was nothing less than that in his mind. His belief in the American Navy was unshakable for 66 years until the day he died at 90 years old here in Newport, Rhode Island, in his home on Francis Street, which is from me, three blocks away from where I live today. So again, he comes back into my life. To achieve his goal, he believed that the officers and sailors alike needed advanced training. They needed to have courses in, in foreign policy, in international law, in seamanship. And at the time he was born in 1827 in Albany, New York, there was absolutely no training for naval officers at the time. 15, it was 15 years after the War of 1812 when Oliver Hazard Perry was victorious over the British Royal Navy. America at the time had six ships and nine frigates. And for the next 45 years until the Civil War, the United States paid absolutely no heed to building any kind of a navy, nor were they interested in training the naval officers. In 1841, Luce, at the age of 14, living in Washington, D.C., his father was a bureaucrat there, uh, living in Washington, D.C., saw the ships out at the, and knew immediately that he wanted to board them. That's all you would do at 14. You would jump aboard a ship and you would learn as much as you could because there was no formal training. He stayed at sea from the age 14 to 17. When he came back, he was in many different places at many different times, and throughout his life of 66 years in the Navy, he spent 33 of those years on the sea. He, he was at sea and aboard ships more than any other naval officer in the history of the Navy. In 1845, the War Department finally bought a tract of land at Fort Severn in Annapolis. This would become the Naval Academy. And how many professors did they have? Seven. All of seven professors and 50 cadets. Remember the name midshipman had not come to be at this time. In, 84, in 1846, we went to war with Mexico. Luce was aboard ship. And it was one of the first Navy's real successes on a, on a foreign territory. And I came back, he was uh, quite excited about everything. Four years later, the academy opened up, Annapolis it was still called. And in the first class, four years later, there were only six graduates later on that would, of course, multiply in numbers. By now, Luce had served aboard ship in the Mediterranean, in the South Atlantic, in China, in Japan, and Eastern Pacific. In the same year, 1854, he married his childhood sweetheart, who happened to be my great-great-aunt. He married a Miss Eliza Henley, whose father was a naval officer. And they grew up together in Washington, D.C. It was at this time he was now 27, an old 27, had traveled the entire world, and she was 26, and it was really a perfect match. 
They loved each other till the day they died. And it was very nice at the same time about um, Eliza. I've always thought a lot about Eliza. Um, she was the grandniece of Martha Washington. So when Luce married into this family, he immediately became a little bit more prominent than he had been uh, when he was first born in Albany, New York. Uh, so he always had that um, part of the family that he could lean on. Uh, everyone was very, very, very um, enthusiastic about Luce and his life in the Navy. He went uh, for another four or five years out to the West Indies, and they called him back to be the first assistant to the superintendent of the, of the um, Naval Academy. He stayed there, but this was 1860. 1861, we have the Civil War. And Luce brings the Naval Academy here to Newport, Rhode Island. And if you see right up on Bellevue Avenue, that's where the War College was for four years. Um, we didn't have much of a Navy during the Civil War, 40 ships in all. It grew to be over 600, but the Navy was barely moving along and barely keeping up with the times. And after the Civil War, the Navy was in complete disarray. The ships were pretty much all just, in fact, none of them went into mothballs. They pretty much uh, destroyed all the ships because they were no longer going to be useful. Luce was upset. He believed we needed a strong Navy, but he got no support from Congress. He got no support from the Secretary of the Navy. He got no support from his fellow officers. And he became convinced, although no one supported him, that he was gonna go aboard ships and teach and have training and do it himself. And he did that for five years. At five years, came back, and finally, we ended up with what was the Naval War College in 1884. Um, the Secretary of the Navy Chandler had finally funded some money, and Luce had been asking for this for 25 years. No one paid any attention, but at the same time, they gave him money, and they gave him an 1819 rundown house on Coasters Harbor. They gave him no funding, no instructors, no students, no curriculum, and no heat. It was disastrous for the first 12 months. Absolutely nothing happened. Um, I'll call him Uncle Stephen. He asked for a top man to come and take a place at the college with him, a younger officer by the name of Mahan. They would not allow Mahan to come and work with him without taking Luce out of his spot as the first president. So they sent Luce to sea, and they brought in Mahan to be the president. I don't think Luce ever got over that. So we're getting to the end of his career. He retired in 1889 to Francis Street, just up the hill here in Newport. And shortly after that, the word midshipman replaced cadet engineers. I didn't realize it had taken so long for midshipmen to become midshipmen, because I always call them just midshipmen. Um, so he had retired, and World War I broke out. Luce was here. They gave him special permission to teach over at the War College whenever he wished, and he wrote some wonderful, absolutely wonderful and amazing speeches which he gave for a period of 10 years before retiring on Francis Street with Eliza and several of his children and grandchildren. He was a devout Episcopalian and a member here of Trinity Church. And I must just finish with this. He died feeling a failure, a total failure, that Washington politics had succeeded in destroying his dream of a college for naval officers. But he knew in his heart that the destructive forces of war and battle were only those things you wanted to prevent. And war was nothing more than something to keep a bay. And that is the reason he wanted the strongest Navy in the world, so that we would have no war. 
He never gave up on wanting a U.S. Navy to be the best in, on the globe, in the world. I say that over and over. And he wanted the best for its officers. He wanted them to be smart, compassionate. And if war were to be inevitable, he wanted them to be fighting nobly, ethically, and with integrity. Thank you. That was a beautiful history lesson. Thank you very much. He'd be happy to know how well Washington now is working, though. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't help myself there. So we have a celebrity with us uh, here this morning, now afternoon. Bill Pickney, Captain Bill Pickney. Just consider, let the, sink this in for, let this sink in for a minute. The first African American to solo navigate the world via Cape Horn, which is the hard way. He did that, pretty strong. He had 5,000 schools learning uh, through his textbook, which he'd written for first graders, and uh, has been honored by presidents, including President Bush, uh, senators, people from all over the world. He's been on the board of Mystic Seaport, on the board of the American Sail Training Association. He's a member of the New York Yacht Club, I might add. and. Uh, he was featured in a, a series of PBS television programs, so his name became well known. And uh, we're gonna talk a lot about him tonight and hear from him this evening. But I think uh, our next inductee is gonna make a few remarks here and a few more later tonight. What an honor, sir, to have you here today. Bill Pickney. King said to all of his wives, uh, don't worry, I'm not going to keep you long. <laughs> I'd like to thank the National Sailing Hall of Fame for this honor and for this wonderful sight where sailors and non-sailors will be able to see and enjoy the wonders of the sport that we love. Peter Aldridge, David Evans, Todd Johnson and the late Thomas Eastman formed the major sponsorship for my trip around the world. Thank you. I'd like to give a special thanks to Jacob Fisher and the Bitter End Yacht Club, who are my first and early sponsors and have been with me ever since and supported my ever efforts. Also uh, to Ralph Loren, for making me look like an adult today. <laughs> I'm a statistical failure. When I was a teenager, the statistics were that I would, before age of 21, be involved in violent crimes, I would be addicted to drugs, and I would be probably killed by one of those things. Uh, that never happened. It was not because it was a miracle. No, it was the support of those who believed in me and not the statistics. Mark Twain said, there are lies, damn lies, and statistics. The saying goes, behind every successful man, there's a woman. Well, I've been blessed. I've had five. <laughs> Not wives. <laughs> My mother, Marion Pinckney, who saw the wider world from the homes and kitchens where she worked, 
and taught me that I deserved a place beyond my beginnings and taught me the rules of the road. Next was a teacher, Gladys Berry in Chicago, who saw me not as a lost cause, but as an adventurer that I would eventually become through reading. Next was a woman who was also a teacher, Mame Reynolds, who saw the sea and sailors in the round the world race as a means of education for the children that she taught. That inspired me to dedicate my sail to education. And next, my former wife, Ina Pinckney, who the statement made when I asked her if I wanted, if she'd be upset if I went out and sailed around the world, was she said, I'd be upset if you didn't go and fulfill your dream. And finally, my wife, Magdalia Vachier Pinckney, who was not part of the original dream, but lived the dream through transcribing all the multitude of tapes that I made on my voyage and made that into what became my autobiography. You can ask her about rainbows when uh, you see her. It's a great story about that. There are so many people to thank who have supported, encouraged, cajoled, and even the doubters who made this moment even sweeter. To join my heroes, I cannot express accurately the emotions today that I feel. It's really overwhelming. The sea provides the most level playing field of any sport. It cares nothing about your age, your sex, your color, your religion, your nationality, and your ability or lack thereof will be extracted in a short period of time by a stiff breeze, a squall, or a storm. I came to the sport, sport later than most of my fellow in, uh, attendees here, but I wanted to make it a benchmark for my grandchildren. I'd like to acknowledge the one who, is, along with her brother, made this a possibility, my granddaughter, April Walton. <laughs> to the board that saw it fit to make my efforts on land and sea worthy of a Lifetime Achievement Award, thank you. My presence here confirms that those sailors, past and present, recreational and professional, who look like me, are not regarded as an anomaly, but are rather a part of the greater sailing community. The late Paul Mixon founded the Black Boater Summit. For over 20 years, brought black sailors from all over the country to the BVI to show them what our love for the sea was all about. Many of those men and women are today sailing on tour groups in the Mediterranean, Seychelles Islands, Croatia, Tahiti. There are at least 10 prominently or predominantly black yacht clubs and sailing clubs. Hampton University one of the historically black colleges and university has both a men's and a women's collegiate sailing team that compete nationally. And finally, I'd like to recognize two Hall of Famers from a different sport where we are considered a rarity. I'd like to introduce Ben Finley, And Arthur Clay, who is not here today, who were last year inducted into the Skiing and sail uh, Snowboarding Hall of Fame. <laughs> they started an association of 53 black ski clubs with over 5,000 members in the United States and England. And this group is welcomed annually to their joint meetings at the finest ski resorts nationally and internationally. The United States 
by its very population is diverse. What we need to do now is to embrace our diversity. Thank you all for this. Bill, I want to tell you just a quick story here. Uh, I was on the board of Hampton University circa 1994, and about the third board meeting, our athletic director is giving a presentation, and I put my hand up and said, do we have a sailing here, team here? And they kind of looked at me sideways. No, we don't. I said, well, let's get one going. And uh, we got a fleet of lasers, Peter Johnstone, who's here with us today. I was on the board of uh, Sunfish Laser at the time. And we got a fleet of lasers, and then we got a fleet of uh, flying juniors at Hampton. And uh, two things happened. I was looking around for a sailing coach, and I called up Gary Bodie, who's the coach of the US Naval Academy, and said, Gary, surely you must know some assistant coach who'd like to be a head coach. And he said, well, how about me? I'll take the job. I said, really? Yeah, my family's down in that area. So we got, I called the president, Bill Harvey, at Hampton. I said, well, we got our coach. The head coach of the Naval Academy is coming to uh, Hampton, which was uh, very cool. So I thought you'd appreciate knowing that. Okay. So this is our halfway point. <laughs> you know, we did instruct everybody to keep it under five minutes, but as you can tell, it was slightly over. But we have two more great people to induct into our National Sailing Hall of Fame. Don Riley. So I, I, I first met Don Riley uh, at the Whitbread Round the World race in 1989, graduate of Mich Michigan State University, where both my father and sister had gone to. And Dawn has had a remarkable career, which is far from over at the present time. She did twice doing uh, the Whitbread race and the Volvo Ocean race. She's been on multiple America's Cup campaigns, uh, led it, America True, one of the semifinalists down in Auckland way back in uh, 2000. And I think uh, significantly she's been part of the Women's Sports Foundation, which was founded by the great tennis player, Billie Jean King. She was chairman of that for, uh, for a little while. And most recently she's been uh, the executive director of Oak Cliff Sailing, which is getting so many people out on the water, but also getting to be really high level sailors. So Dawn, congratulations on being inducted. It's a real honor and we look forward to hearing from you. Dawn Riley. I'm going to keep it under five minutes. <laughs> so thank you for having me here. Um, I keep being told that I am young. And then last night, somebody came up to me and said, I can't believe how hard you're still working, as if I'm ancient. I think part of it is I've been doing this for a really long time. And when I was 13, I was also here, but not at that press conference, that famous press conference. Um, in Newport when we were sailing around uh, for a year with our family and my sister brother and I spent the whole four days we were in Newport looking for this magical place we'd heard all of the adults talk about the candy store <laughs> so that story came up last night <laughs> As I said, um, I became a professional very young. When I was 15, I started working on and around boats so that I'd be able to go to Michigan State University where I started sailing with Renee, AKA Stick Chick, who now works for the Navy. This is a very convoluted uh, group that we have here. She was the beginning of a m huge group of people that I've been able to sail with. And as I've been sitting here listening to the speeches, I've been multitasking and looking and realizing how many people in this room I've sailed with and against and at least had a glass of wine with. So it's, a, it's an amazing tent that we formed and that, we're, that we have going on. Um, 
The thing that I'm most happy about today is to be included in the first class that comes close to some kind of diversity. And having three women and Bill, who's kick-ass, in this group is amazing. And I want to recognize this, that we need to continue to do this in all of our teams, whether it's business or sailing. We know that for some groups, it's 10 times harder to get into that tent. So can we just agree to ask three times more? How are you? Do you want to come sailing? Have you ever been sailing? Do you know anybody here at the candy store? Let me introduce you. Do you know where the candy store is? I will show you. I see a future in our sport with equity, equality, diversity, and with leaders who naturally ask these questions. And I will say that at Oak Cliff, which we have board members and people who have supported us there, that all we do is ask those questions, be open, and it is naturally diverse, naturally gender rich, and it's easy and it's smooth like butter. Finally, there's one thing that I need to clarify in all of the nice things that Gary's written about uh, my history. I was not the Commodore of the North Star Sail Club Junior Yacht Club. Our yacht at Sea Scout Ship 147 was a Du 427 painted, no, gel coated, a horrific color orange that we would go sailing on when we were 14, 15, 16. Our meetings were often sleepovers in front of the fire after we'd cooked chocolate chip cookies in the kitchen that was self-serve, and it may have involved an access to the self-serve bar, but I'm not saying anything. My point is, is that this sport is fun, it can be inclusive, it's wonderful to be able to get out there. I love the idea of it's the great equalizer, that squall that comes through. By the way, the Great Lakes, Detroit, you want to learn how to sail, come here. Thunderstorms every afternoon, guaranteed. But I just want to ask you to help me continue to have fun and to share safely, professionally, most importantly, sincerely in sharing our sport outside and bringing everybody into the tent. Thank you. Don, thanks for the clarification. So Dick, uh, you're our final inductee today, and it's just because you are alphabetically the last in line, so don't read anything else into it. Dick Rose, graduate of Princeton University, was a great collegiate sailor at that time, and has had a distinguished career racing on the water. But I think his most important contribution is with the racing rules of sailing. Harold Vanderbilt took a good look at the rules and basically rewrote them. Harry Anderson's father was very much involved with those uh, drafting of the rules at that time. And Dick has been the authority on the racing rules of sailing in the world. He's on the racing rules committee at World Sailing. He served on multiple committees and working parties at the US sailing level. And uh, if you ever, even, even Dave Perry will ask Dick Rose a question uh, about the racing rules of sailing. And uh, a lot of people don't know, Dick, that you're the guy that makes sure that every word in that book is proper and commas there. And I got to uh, spend four years at World Sailing uh, in my role as vice president, being the liaison with the racing rules of sailing committee. So as part of that job, you sit in on the meetings. You think it was long this morning? <laughs> Sit there. But watching the sausage be made, I realized what care goes into making our rules, and Dick is the reason. Congratulations, Dick Rose.
Well, at the IYRU, ISAF, World Sailing, whatever it's called this week, the, the, when we meet, we meet for eight hours. So, but I only have one page, so you, it, you'll be saved today. <laughs> I, I want to quickly uh, start by thanking people who put together my nomination for the Hall of Fame. I, I had no idea that, that, uh, that there was this uh, part of the Hall of Fame which, rep uh, which uh, represents uh, contributors. So the people who helped to put that together, Ellen Benson led it. Ellen was my editor at Yachting when I first wrote something for a magazine. And as a tireless worker, an excellent editor, and she, she gathered all the information about me and sent it in and organized it, organized people to write letters on my behalf. Uh, those letters were written, as I understand, I'm not sure about all of them, but the, the ones that I know of were written by Burke Thomas, Dave Perry, Joe Klein, who's the editor of 48 North uh, Magazine. I know that behind the scenes, Bob Johnstone and Gary Jobson were very much uh, on my side and, and pushing for uh, this honor that I've been given today. So thank you to all those people. I also wanted to, uh, I, I was kind of thinking, how did I get here? Uh, why am I uh, this guy who learned the rules and, and, and devoted a lot of years to the rules? And I, I thought about the development of, of that, and it, it goes back to my, my first sailboat race. Uh, my parents got me a boat. Uh, they didn't know how to sail. They weren't sailors. My mother had sailed in college, in, uh, camp one summer, but uh, uh, that was the only connection we had to sailing. And they bought me a Lolly 15. Now, everybody in the room who ever heard of the Lolly 15, raise your hand. Oh, there's a few, okay. It was a junior trainer in the 1940s, and uh, it was safe. Parents liked it because it had buoyancy, com it looked like a snipe, but it had buoyancy compartments fore and aft, and it had a, a slug of 300 pounds of keel that surrounded the centerboard that went up and down through it. So it wouldn't capsize. If you got hit with a big puff, you swamped. So you'd send the kids out with a bucket. It does a <laughs> sail by two. And if we swamped, we bucketed it out and kept racing. And, uh, and the parents didn't worry about that because you wouldn't sink. Anyway, Frank Robinson, a star sailor of the Peconic Gardner, Gardner's Bay Star Fleet in eastern Long Island, was the instructor at the South Old Yacht Club in the 1940s for kids. And he didn't, he, he just, he threw us right into racing. I mean, there wasn't much of this sort of drills or learning, learning things about the boat. It was, let's go have a race. And I was dead last at first. And, uh, but I, I persisted, I loved it, and uh, I was challenged by, by it, by, by the, by the sport, and I stayed at it. But I remember Frank because he particularly stressed for all of us that this is an, a unique sport. There are no referees, there are no umpires. You're on your own. You're on your honor to follow the rules, and you're also encouraged if there's someone who isn't following the rules or you think someone isn't following the rules to protest them, to enforce the rule, and, and uh, work out uh, whether you were wrong in, in, the, in the guess that they broke a rule or whether they broke a rule. And he, he told a story about racing his star in the Worlds in 1928 in New Orleans. And he trailed his star to New Orleans. Now in 1928, that was a big trip to, uh, to take a keelboat that far uh, on America's highways, which weren't that well developed. And on the way, it rattled and shook all the way down there. He lost the clevis pin out of his outhaul fitting. And rigging the boat to go out for sail, he thought, oh, damn, we need a clevis pin. And they found a nail. And they bent the nail and they put it in there. And in the early race of the, 
Star Worlds with no throwouts. Uh, he's on port tack. He thought he could clear a starboard tack boat. And his nail that he'd put in the outhaul twanged on the force day of another star. Now, this was possible in those days because the star had a really long boom and it was a different rig than we know today. Anyway, he told that story. He retired from the race. He f finished rather well in the regatta, but not as far as high up as he could have. And uh, he, he, that that story stuck with me. That 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 was what your obligation was. I went on. I I sailed in junior sailing, and then went to Princeton, where the founder of the club was one of the Hall of Fame's. Uh, inductees, Arthur Knapp, Jr. And Arthur uh, wanted to help the Princeton sailing team. And he bought an interclub dinghy for frostbiting at the Larchmont fleet, with the Larchmont fleet. And he absolutely maintained it exactly as he maintained his own boat, uh, except that it was black with an orange water stripe, Princeton colors. And he made it available for the undergraduates to sail in the frostbite regattas at Larchmont. Well, the problem was you had to drive from Princeton to Larchmont for the day, race for three hours, and then drive home. And it was winter. And we weren't allowed to have cars at Princeton. But the sailing team had an exemption for one car. And one of our members had his favorite old Chevrolet that that he loved, and he, he didn't sail much, but he joined the club so that he could have his car at Princeton. But we had, we had the right to use it. So uh, there was another sailor in my class, Gordon Jennings, and we were really into uh, getting, getting going in collegiate sailing and wanted to improve during our years at college. So we would borrow this old Chevy and drive it up snowy days, whatever the weather, through New York City, up to Larchmont, where Arthur would have our boat for us, and uh, we would race. And Arthur would coach us between races. That fleet had about 50, 50 boats there. Well, maybe, maybe only 40, but it was a big fleet racing on the harbor in Larchmont. And uh, we ran about eight races a day, just bang, 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 one right after another. And Arthur's coaching, he, he wanted to win. He was out there to absolutely one of the most competitive people I know. He was racing his own boat. Uh, and you have to understand, you get a, wanna get a little visual picture of Arthur racing his boat. He ha always had a pipe clutched in his mouth. It was an, uh, a sort of Sherlock Holmes pipe with the droopy, uh, droopy pipe. And it's clutched between his teeth. He was a big man. You had to have 250 pounds of people on board the boat, but he made up most of that by himself. So he would have a child that somehow he had convinced the parents to let this child come <laughs> race with him. The child looked like the Michelin child, was so bundled in clothes with a life jacket on top, and the, so there would be this small person sort of wandering around in the front of Arthur's boat while he raced. So he would come by anyway between races and look at us and say, you damn fools, you started at the wrong end of the line, your outhaul is too loose, you're sitting a little bit too far aft, and you should bunch your weight. And he's gone. No, that's it. That's your code. But, you know, if we moved forward in the boat, we bunched the weight, we tightened the outhaul, and we started at the other end of the line, we beat five more boats, and that was encouraging. And he would give these hints between races. Anyway, he, he really uh, turned us into much better sailors than we were when we started. Then I went on to graduate school, and um, I was racing penguins at the time, and Gardner Cox lived outside of of, uh, of, of Pennsylvania, where I, I was at graduate school. And I had raced with his, uh, I guess it would have been his nephew, Bill Cox, Jr. Uh, we were the skippers on the Princeton team. And so I'd gotten to know the Cox family a bit. And Gardner made, Gardner and his wife Barbara made their house a, a home away from home for me. If I, if I wanted to get away from graduate school for an evening and, and have a fix 
I'd go out there, then Barbara would cook dinner. Gardner and I would talk until the wee hours of the day, of the, of the morning, and uh, I'd, I'd, they gave me a bed, and I'd sleep, and we, Gardner and I would go back on the train in the, in the morning to, to Philadelphia. And Gardner, if, if you read his columns that were, I think, in Sale Magazine for years, he kind of was a philosopher of our sport for a few years. And, and uh, I learned a lot about the sport and the sociology of the sport. I don't know how to put it, but I, I, I became very interested in how people and their relationships and so on led to the to the success of the sport. And the final person I'd like to, to uh, uh, there's two more I want, I want to, to point out uh, who sort of shaped me. One was Eric Twinane, mostly through his writings. He was a Brit. And uh, however, there was a night, I was at the Cork Regatta up in Kingston, and I'd rented, uh, part of our group had rented a, one of the student housing buildings for Queen's University. And uh, uh, the Brits, some Brits were in the building as well, including Eric. And we'd got to talk all late into one night. And uh, he gave me a, a principle about the sport, which I had not heard from anybody in all the reading. I, I was quite bookish. I taught myself to sail uh, a lot of it by, by reading and uh, learning about the sport. Eric told a story about how he had um, he'd given a, a long talk in, at, to a group of, sa of sailors at, in the UK and it was well attended, big audience, and after the talk was over, a reporter, a young reporter came up to him and said, Mr. Twinane, Mr. Twainman, I'm going to report on your, your very successful evening here, but I'm not given much space. Could you give me one word that's important for thinking about sailboat racing? And Eric was not happy with that question after he had given this thoughtful long talk with lots of points and he kind of dismissed the reporter and then he said you know later I thought there was an answer for her for that reporter I should have said that the most important thing about sail boat racing is priorities on any given day at any given point in any given race there's something that's most important and something that, and lots of things that aren't very important. If you're sailing in the, in the, around here with the north, northerlies you get, the, sh the sh wind shifts are huge and they oscillate and there's a pattern. And if you can get in tune with that pattern, you could leave the jib home and win the race. And um, uh, other days it's current. Another day it's very steady wind, the course is well known by, to everybody, and you better have your boat speed right. And so that was uh, quite a lesson from him. Anyway, in the middle of all this, I'm studying uh, psychology and how people perceive the world and make decisions. And um, that somehow what the sport of sailing is all about, perceiving the world, understanding your boat, understanding your competitors and putting it all together. And uh, so it was clear to me that we couldn't really have a sport without rules. And that they were important in the time I grew up, there were throwouts weren't that prevalent. So boy, you had to, if you broke a rule, that was, that was a big loss for you. So. I studied the rules hard, and uh, I got a chance at a meeting that was held in Seattle of the U.S. Rules Committee uh, to, to go over and listen. They, they, they wouldn't allow me to speak. Uh, they, that was the custom of the committee. They, they would be at a table, and the observers were around the outside. So I'm observing, and they're working on some rule, and uh, I'm thinking, I, I think I could word that rule. The, I, I could solve the problem they're working on. 
but I didn't say anything. And then there was a coffee break. So I went up and, and uh, talked to Bill Benson and said, you know, wouldn't this wording work? Uh, and he said, oh, thank you very much. And uh, that was the end of that. And, and uh, uh, I, I went back to sitting in the, uh, along the, at the outside. And then the next, about two weeks later, I got a letter, would you be interested in joining the committee? So that's how it, that's how it all sort of come to, came together. I've, I want to uh, thank all those people that I've named, but I also want to leave you with, a, with a, a message. I've had a goal that I wanted to preserve the sport with its, its basic principle that we govern, we, we follow the rules, we don't need umpires, we don't need, we don't need referees. And I wanted to see it grow. I think it's such a magnificent game. It, it's a game that is three games in one. You're, you're against Mother Nature. You're against your boat. You've got to tame your boat. You've got to bring your boat under control. And it's a chess game where all the, pl all, the pawn, all the players, all the pieces on the chessboard are in motion. And, uh, and, and you, you have to position your boat relative to that. But if we don't have a set of rules, we don't have that game. The rules govern the tactics greatly, but they also make it so that the boats come home in relatively large pieces at the end of the race. <laughs> and that makes it financially feasible for us to engage in this sport. So I've been an advocate of simple rules and an advocate of keeping the basic principle in the sport and I feel like I'm losing on both counts. And I thought with this audience, I'd like to say that keep, be on the lookout for young people who want to protect your system of rules. If we, we've gone now in match racing, we, we rely, uh, it, you can't really have match racing without umpires, I know that. But we've lost the basic principle in match racing. We don't rely on the competitor to take his penalty and, that, and, and only use the umpire if, if he doesn't. And so I think we've lost, a, lost something there because now you have the situation where the competitor, he may break a rule, but if the umpires don't call it, he doesn't take the penalty. And, and that's, we lost something when we have that because it's just not gonna work for us to have umpires and have big regattas for kids or for adults. There just won't be enough of them on the water able to see all the situations and it, it just can't be. So we need people who will defend that principle and who will work to keep the rules simple. I have a principle I, I try on all sorts of people who are thinking about, why don't you write this rule? Well, you could say it this way, and so on. And, and uh, we work towards simple language on the rules committees that I sit on. And I wish that you, people would try this criterion. If you write a rule, take it to the local junior program Find some kids who are enthused about the sport and see if they understand it. If, if the people who were coming into the sport don't understand the rules, uh, the sport can't, can't thrive. So I think those, are, those have been my goals, to have uh, simple rules and follow this basic principle of sportsmanship. And uh, thank you very much for the honor you bestowed. Thank you, Dick. Ladies and gentlemen, that completes our program for this morning. Um, thank you for all for being here. If I may encourage you all to come back and see us this summer, or next summer, I guess, um, when we're open and we have the exhibits here. I think you'll find, I'm hoping you're gonna find it, it was gonna be an extraordinary experience for you. Thank you. Thank you again, Gary. And one more round of applause for our class of 21.